Hello, and welcome to Kyber Shards, a 5th edition actual play show set in the Eberron campaign world. Eric has moved, as you can see, <laughs> permanently to a living... a hotel in Texas. In a, in a hotel. <laughs> no, Eric's on the road, um, and uh, but obviously we needed to have Ari uh, as our... As our topic grumpy, this week, grumpy since Ari. this was a, a bit of rather charged episode uh, for for Ari. Before we dive in to that, uh, I do want to remind you all that we are doing our subscription push. We're going to be giving away another uh, Lazy Fox creation, this time a Kyber Shards dice bag. Uh, and we will run that giveaway as soon as the channel hits 100 subscriptions. So we are more than halfway there. Uh, so if you have, if you are watching and you haven't hit that subscribe button, hit that subscribe button, help us to get there. And then we'll do another giveaway of another wonderful handmade D and D accessory, uh, from the lazy Fox creates. So this was, this was a fun one. It's interesting being so far ahead and rewatching these episodes where we have these big arguments. Yeah. Um, because I knew this was a good episode because I was into it while I was editing. Like I was, I wanted to argue with characters while, while I was editing. Um, and that was fun, but also this, that we got a quite a lot of reaction from the watch party. <laughs> we'll get into uh, and they it. mostly, <laughs> they mostly didn't super agree with Ari. Um, yeah. so, um, let's, let's dive into that. We have a question that touches on that. So let me read that question and then, um, we can kind of dive Get into, into this. It. This is from Mia. Uh, Mia. I'm curious about Ari's desire to follow Thora's plan. It didn't surprise me that Ari would go that route, but I'm confused or not confused. Sorry. I'm curious if you are okay sharing how much of that was Eric and how much of that was Ari. And were either Ari or Eric surprised at the pushback Ari received from Pog and Shade? The whole thing certainly led to some deep conversations, which is one of the things that speaks to the quality of this show. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, so, thoughts? Yeah. So, uh, one big thing that I will say that, not not entirely, but there is a pretty strong Venn diagram overlap of, like, worldview when it comes to Ari and Eric. Um, I, mm -hmm. I will say, and I, I don't want to say that was intentional on my part. It just kind of happened. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, and I was in the watch party and kind of saw the reaction, uh, and what people were saying about the arguments that Ari and Pog, and then I would say the Ari and Shay, it was much more of a conversation, uh, yeah. surrounding the Thora Dane divide. Um, but you know, Ari has always been on board with Thora's version of protection. I mean, even if you go back to the treehouse conversations uh, in like chapter one of this campaign, when Ari and Ezri were talking about uh, how to exist in the city and how to be protected, Ari has always been saying like, we need to like make a, our presence known in the community and then align ourselves with powerful people in the community that we can have a symbiotic relationship with. And with that, those relationships, come protection because if you mess with us then you mess with all of us like spider-man new york um so so yeah that that's always been ari's desire is if we get entrenched in Stormreach enough then we can um we can affect systemic change within Stormreach to make it a safe haven for aberrant marked people and ari thinks that Dane's plan of going and repurposing a murder machine designed to hunt aberrant marked people, reprogramming that to, as Dane put it, flip it back on them, on true marked people, and then using it to hunt down the black wheel people to take them out and thereby eliminating the threat entirely is extremely dangerous and extremely short-sighted because if you kill everybody in black wheel, the world still doesn't trust aberrant marked people. Sure. The people that like it's, it's, it's difficult to talk about it because black wheel is like a covert operation. 
at least based yeah. on my understanding of Eberron. Like not even everybody in the marked houses know about Black Wheel. Right, um, right. So sure, like these are the people that are in the highest position of power and have the strongest driving resources to hunt aberrant marked people. But they're not the only people. They're not yeah. like, surely there are other people in the marked house that's like, hey, it'd be nice if there weren't aberrant marked people. Now they yeah. might have a more humane approach of like, oh, we figured out how to remove dragon marks. So all these poor aberrant marked people, we can remove your marks. So you're not a threat to people anymore. Sorry if I stole a future X-Men-esque storyline. <laughs> um, but so so that's Ari's thing is that like, as long as the houses view the marks as an othered threat, it's never going to get better. And Dane's plan does not address that. And part of the discussion in the watch party was Ari's position being one of inaction. And Pog also talked about this of like, we are under active threat right now. So why won't we do something to address that active threat? And Ari's view and my view as Ari, um, and, and there was a lot of discussion about connecting this discussion to real world stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Caveat, I am an extremely white man. So when it comes to talking about persecution and how to address right. that from a societal level, I am coming from all the positions of privilege. So uh, this is me talking about my worldview of Ari living in a fantasy world as an aberrant marked person. Any correlations sure. therein to real world events notwithstanding. So, um, if the houses were in Stormreach, like in the streets, actively attacking the mansion, then Ari's view would be totally different. Like, yes, sure. we have to go a deal with this problem because they are actively trying to kill us at our house. We heard about a potential thing that was going on in Blackbriar. Dane's people went and got themselves caught. I know that's reductive, but that's, you know, they went sure, into a yeah. situation that, that Thora told them not to. This is a bad idea. This is dangerous. Don't do it. They did it anyway. They got caught. Then we went into Blackbriar and were attacked by a murder machine that they were developing. It right. wasn't like the murder machine showed up at the house. So Ari's whole point is if we go attack the houses, if let's say everything with the cannon facility goes well, we get the murder bot, we unleash it on Black Wheel. Now we've made ourselves an enemy of all of the houses. Now the mansion's going to get destroyed. It's going to get blown up. The full force of the dragon marked houses will be brought down upon us because we have killed many high ranking officials where, as Ari said, we're exactly what they say, they think we are. Right. And um, Ari would much rather work to create a place that is safe systemically for aberrant marked people here and now. And I think that's the the interesting dichotomy is Pog, and I think I remember Ari said this to Shade, like, not attacking is not the same as inaction. Like, Ari right. wants to attack the problem, just not attack yeah. the people behind the problem. Like, Ari's never wanted to do a murder. So, uh, so that hasn't changed. Like, Ari doesn't think the solution to every problem is kill the people that are causing <laughs> you the problem which right. cannot be said for the rest of this party. Um, <laughs> so uh, if they're dead, they can't cause any more problems, which sure. So it's true. That, well, it's not exactly true. I mean, this is, but they, there's necromancy <laughs> that that's also true. But then also like you might, they might have a, 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 a much bigger entity that liked them and now right. will come after you. Uh, yeah. It's like, we, we could have killed um, Miravella. Uh, sure. It wouldn't um, have gone well for us. I mean, well, theoretically, we could have killed Miravella. Um, yes. But it would have gone poorly down the road. Yes. Um, so that's Ari's position is that, sure, we can go off, we can kill all of Black Wheel, and it will not solve our problems. It will not make right. our world safer. It will not make our lives safer. In fact, it will probably make things worse because now we've painted a target on us, not aberrant mark people in general. It will have made things worse for aberrant marked people, but specifically right. us and the kids in the mansion will be put into active danger as opposed to theoretical danger. Um, yeah. So that's that's where Ari and Eric kind of stand on this whole thing is that the houses aren't hunting us right now. Mm -hmm. So we can 
we can build up defenses, both societally yeah. and literally. Um, yeah. And we we know an attack is coming, so let's prepare for the attack rather than going and making the attack worse. So, yeah. So I, I'm curious, something about the conversation that struck me was there were lots of moments uh, where watching where we're watching back, I think kind of in the moment as well, but we're watching back, especially uh, where I wanted to come back in as Dane and say something because like, I didn't feel like you guys, I don't feel like you guys got my point quite right this time. And, and like, I wanted to come back in. That was not Dane. That was Roy Kent. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and so I wondered, you know, having, having DM'd a lot yourself, uh, including on, on, the podcast on everyone renewed um do you have those moments do you have those moments where the players are discussing something that the the npcs have said and you're just pulling your hair out because you want to say something on their behalf but they wouldn't they're philip, not here and they wouldn't show up philip philip the level of frustration i saw you exhibiting in the watch party and in the moment while we were playing uh not so much in campaign one of everyone renewed but DMing for Eris, the amount of uh, misrepresentation <laughs> that your characters put my NPCs through to their face, <laughs> like, <laughs> it felt a little like justice, you know. Um, <laughs> um, like, so, um, so yeah, no, I, I have had that moment, not just with you, but with, with other players yeah. where it's... It's one of those things where, like, I acknowledge, like, oh, I said that. I could have said that a better way or sure. um, they they misheard or they're misremembering. Or, I mean, in all honesty, if I've had that moment as Ari where, like, Ari's sure. out of the room and Pog and Shader talk about something Ari said. And I'm there like, not nah, like, what? <laughs> That's not at all what I meant. Like, um, and so, yeah. Or just talking face to face with Ezri. Ari's just like, D were you listening to what I just, like, <laughs> um so no, like I, I have definitely had that moment and, um, I think I, I do this more than you. I feel like where like, I will occasionally chime in and be like, I, I understand if this is a character thing you're doing, but I just want to make sure that you as the player right. remember, this is what, and I think I've done that right. with you while you're role-playing Eris before and you went, no, I know, I know what uh, my character is just being my character. Like, okay, Eris is super unfair. Sure. Eris is <laughs> Eris is fair to no one in her representations. Everything, everything gets filtered through some very, very. I don't know what color glasses Eris wears. But it's, <laughs> it's it's some really intense tinting that is on yeah. Eris's glasses. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. It's, so yes. So that was that was a. Uh, this was probably the biggest one where I where I felt that way because I like, and at the same time, even watching it back, I knew. I didn't want Dane to stay in that conversation. Like that was, yeah. Dane is not the let's sit around. And I mean, this is why Dane was not the tactical leader of, of his unit. That was Thora. Thora is the, the planner and the schemer and the thinker. And, and Dane is the, the man of action. Like Dane, mm -hmm. Dane's the action hero. Who's going to go, he's going to go bust some heads. Um, And so I, I feel really good about that, but it was, it was a little ironic, maybe not ironic. I've, everyone misses uses ironic, so I'm going to go for it. Um, that I take him out, and then immediately I'm like, "But nope, uh, no, mm. uh, 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 uh. yep." Um, but no, he wouldn't yeah. come back, and, and he wouldn't have put up with it anyway. So, and and part of the thing is that like there was some intentional. I don't want to say like outright misrepresentation, but there was definite reduction of Dane's intention on Ari's sure. part, just from a, a rhetorical standpoint of like making his argument, like, because sure, there's a billion different lines of nuance that we can get into about why Ari thinks Dane's plan is wrong. But a, that would be very boring content. And B, yeah. we don't need like four hour long episodes. Um, <laughs> so, right. you know, reduce it down to he, his plan's dangerous. It could go wrong a million ways, including genocide. Okay, well, right. that's that's, but obviously, then you're you're saying that Dane wants to commit genocide, which is obviously right. not what he actually wants. Um, sure, that he says, well, and it's right. <laughs> well, and Colin will be on next week, and I need to ask Colin this uh, how how it is because sometimes I wonder if it's frustrating to Colin to 
have to filter someone else's point through Pog's very simplistic way of thinking about things. Uh, yeah. Because you know Colin understands the nuance in what people say, and you know that Pog doesn't. And so watching yeah. the conversation, watching what Pog said about it, I was like, you know that's not what anyone – like, it's uh, – that's – that's also a very funny element. Of it. And, and it's, it's cool to see everyone hold to their character. Like it's cool to see, uh, yeah. but it is, um, it, it is, I don't know. Uh, honestly, dramatic irony of, I know yeah. that the players understand and would make different decisions, but like, I, I, I can play characters that have wildly different worldviews than I do, or think differently about mm -hmm. the world. Cause you know, I'm a DM. I role play villains all the time. I don't actually want to kill a bunch of people, um, right. or brainwash them. <laughs> Uh, but I, I, it might legit give me an ulcer or an aneurysm to try and do what, like Pog uh, or Colin and Casey do with Pog and Shade of like ha having to self censor that much of like I have a character that like has this background and this upbringing and so uh, the way they communicate is so different from how I as a person communicate. Yeah. I don't know if I could do it because I would just get so frustrated. <laughs> like it's, um, so, it's so amazing to watch both of them knowing knowing their actual personalities so well uh and yeah. how different pog and shade are from them yeah so yeah. kudos to uh, those players indeed um so we had a few other questions uh emily says eric generally speaking do you enjoy time travel in stories and what story do you think did time travel best i think i think time travel stories are a lot of fun and time travel can have its place in stories when appropriate and set up correctly. Like, uh, I think the, the one that did the best is back to the future. It's simple. Yeah. It's straightforward. You don't need the, all the science. It's like, we need 1.21 gigawatts of electricity and some plutonium and we're good. Um, but well, it helps that it's a comedy, right? Like we can, yeah. we can laugh at the, yeah. at the contradictions. Yeah. Um, I also do appreciate how Looper did it, where it was like, as soon as Joseph Gordon-Levitt mm. asks Bruce Willis, he's like, no, 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 no. I would need yarn and like all kinds. Of, we're not doing this. <laughs> it works. We're not going to talk about it. It's like, great. Whereas like, uh, I mean, we've, I, I, I think I called you the night the episode aired when Game of Thrones introduced time travel. I was like, no, oh, I'm man. out. This is so dumb. Nope. I hate it so much. Um, <laughs> um, so... So I think time travel can have its appropriate place in a story, and I love it when it works well, like Back to the Future. But I really but hate Eric, it. They, when it's they just paid going. it off so well by the end of the season, and you know, <sighs> did so much, did so much with it. It mattered it. so much later on. This isn't, this isn't uh, a Game of Thrones roast show, Philip. If you want, <laughs> if you want to start one, I, I have plenty to talk about, but not. Um, it would be so timely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. House of the Dragons, Eric. <laughs> like, sure. You like this show? Well, let's remind you of why you were worried about it in the first place. Um, <laughs> by the way, everyone, if you if you know what we're talking about, also hate season eight of Game of Thrones. Colin doesn't think it was that bad, so feel free to go to his Twitch stream <laughs> or his Twitter and tell him how wrong he is. <laughs> oh man, that's outstanding. Uh, we have an interesting question from a new viewer who's just yeah. recently joined our Discord. Uh, Legally Blind Gamer uh, asks, I have a question for the DM. That's me, but I'm going to direct it also to Eric because he has some experience with this We've on done the it. DM side. Yes, we have. If someone wanted to play a blind character, how would you go about this? So Eric has DM'd for me playing a character who went... I'm going to say partially blind because there were a yes. bunch of there were a bunch of loopholes to it through magic because fantasy. Yeah. Uh, so the so I mean I I pitched blind to you. Gosh, maybe people don't know that. Um, yeah, they might not know that. It, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there was a game. <laughs> there was a mechanic in a in a character I played. There was a mechanic in the class that was going to give the character blind sight when you blindfold your wheels and it was supposed to be the sort of blindfolded swordsman idea which i love that's a that's a very much a a trope i like um and i thought it would be more interesting and also i kind of felt like the class was kind of powerful i thought it'd be more interesting if that effect were permanent it wasn't just permanent, something yeah. you could turn on and turn off and so i mentioned that to eric and i told him about what level that was going to come up and then i just left it to eric so eric found a way to uh deprive the character of sight 
Um, so I'm, I'm curious having had some experience that what did you feel like were the, were the pitfalls? What were the things that you, that went through your head of, of, were there things you worried about? Were there elements of it that you were like, oh, is this a good idea? What did you think? Yeah. Uh, so it, it was an interesting thing because obviously we have, we have the added wrinkle of we were doing it for an audience. And so there was yeah. um, obviously the level of concern of being respectful about like how we sure. spoke about this and, and how we approached it. Um, and you know, it, it was one of those things of uh, when we were having the conversation and you were pitching it to me, I, uh, I think we kind of went over it. It may not have been that initial conversation, but it was like, okay, what is, what does it look like for you as a player? Like what kind of restrictions would you be okay with? What do you think is too much in terms mm -hmm. of like, like if it's a perception check based around sight, just, you don't, yeah. you don't get a role for that. Like you, you don't have the opportunity, even if your character has a really great passive perception, mm -hmm. uh, sure. you, like you, you, your character has this, um, this element to them that would make that not viable if it's a site based thing. Um, mm -hmm. so I think having that conversation with a player about what mechanical restrictions are you looking for? And additionally, if like what mechanical benefits are you looking for? Like what, what do you want your experience as a player to be by introducing this element to your character? Um, so I think as a DM, that conversation is like the most important thing. Um, yeah. And then, you know, just, it's to, to borrow a uh, like comic strip and they did like a movie about it. Like I think the wrong way to do it is to go like Mr. Magoo with it, where it's like wacky mm. hijinks as a result of the player character being this way. And I think I, I don't think like we utilized something along the lines of critical fumbles. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, you're, you're being attacked by, by bad guys all the time. And the fact that your character was blind was never, the source for, for foibles or for your character no. messing up. Like, um, yeah. so, so it was, it was something that I, as a DM very consciously allowed you to be in charge of the detriments and like mm -hmm. when you wanted the fact that your character did not have the sense of sight to play a negative aspect of your character outside of the mechanical restrictions, like perception text based around sight. Yeah. Uh, but like if, if you rolled a natural one and you wanted like it to be an element of your character, didn't see something coming, then I left that up to you rather than me imposing that on you. Um, cause I feel like yeah. that would be, I, I, I think that's, um, that's true for any, any element of this kind. If you have a, a player that wants to have a character that has like a prosthetic limb or, sure. um, uses something like the battle wheelchair or the combat wheelchair, mm -hmm. um, like presumably the player is making that choice because they think it will be interesting from a character standpoint and you as the DM should not use it as an excuse to treat them differently and take advantage of that element that they've introduced for their character. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I whole, wholeheartedly agree. Um, it's really, what is the, what is the player trying to tell as a story, uh, through this? Is it, um, is it just the, I mean, there's, there's lots of archetypal things about yeah. blindness in myth and in fantasy. And so are you just trying to represent that? Do you just want it to be narrative? Do you want there to be a mechanic thing? Because if the player is not looking for any mechanical benefit, then I'm not necessarily going to push a mechanical detriment. There are other yeah. sites, perception can, or senses, perception can refer to a lot of things. Uh, yeah. Now, I mean, I might, I might necessarily say, there are going to be circumstances where, for example, reading something might just not be possible. There are plenty yeah. of circumstances where it could be, you know, if we're talking about something that's engraved and you want to say you can feel the letters and, and that kind of thing, that's fine. But, you know, there, I would, I would be straightforward of here are the things I can see immediately. You probably just aren't able to do these things. But if the player is asking to play someone who is blind you probably expect that they understand that in the same way that if characters play, if a player wants to play a character that's deaf, they probably understand that there are certain things that are going to be just from a real and, and just a standpoint of role playing. Aren't you think? And so that's probably not going to be a, a point of argument with you. Uh, for me as yeah. a player, because we were on, because we were online uh, and doing it for an audience, 
uh, I was really lucky because we had a, uh, a, a blind listener who reached out uh, and said, hey, if, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And so I was able to get, and it was really cool because um, this listener was not, uh, was not, uh, I forget the medical term and I couldn't find the, the DM, uh, but they were not completely blind. They could still sort of see light, um, but not definition. And that was actually really close to what we were describing with what had happened to the, uh, to the character. And so that was really perfect. And I got lots of advice on what it's like to try and move around using a cane. I got lots of advice on what, what it actually looks like, um, from, from what they described. Uh, they had a, there was a, a video. They s sent me a link to that. Someone had used a, a particular lens to kind of represent what that particular type of blindness uh, looked like. And so I got all this really cool resource just dropped onto my lap. Uh, and that was really cool. And that made it way easier to, to role play in a way that I think made it interesting, gave me ways to describe it because I have had yeah. my sight. I have no idea what it is like. Um, uh, and uh, they gave me some, gave, they gave me a lot of, a lot of good advice, which I followed. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's how I was able to go about it uh, and feel good about the way it was, it was done. Again, there's the wrinkle of the audience because you, you are a little more careful just automatically yeah. uh, as someone doing an audience. But yeah, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't say no if a player wanted to be play blind and I certainly wouldn't say, okay, but it's going to be a big old problem yeah. for you. Yeah. So there, there you go. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, and then Emily asks, between Thora and Dane, whose plan do you think Kara would be more likely to side with? So I feel like there are two separate answers. There's the answer mm -hmm. that actually yeah, answers Thora the question. And Dane. Yeah, well, no, there's the answer that actually answers the question, and then there's the answer that's true to Kara. So the answer that actually answers the question is I feel like Kara would be more inclined to follow Thora just because Kara is not a soldier and does not want to be a soldier. Uh, she wants to be a student at a school mm -hmm. and get room and board and food. And Dane is not offering that. So, um, That's accurate. Um, but Dane doesn't even have, like, he's renting a room and, and yeah. board. <laughs> um, the actual answer is neither. Like, if if Thora were to ask Kara to be a part of her plan, the same way the strike force is involved in her plan, Kara would just leave. Like Kara doesn't want that kind of heat. Kara doesn't want that kind of like, um, she doesn't want to be on anyone's radar, especially from the Mark mm. houses and Aaron all. Those are the two people that she would least want to interact with in the world. So, uh, if, if there's ever the possibility of her ending up on their radar as of right now, she would leave. She just, yeah. she's survived on her own for long enough. She can do it again. So yeah, that's cool. Yep. All right. Uh, well, that is all of our questions for this week. Uh, thank you all so much for submitting questions. If you'd like to submit questions, uh, you can do so in comments on our recent videos. We always go back and check those, uh, or you can do so over on our discord. You can find a link to the geek Pantheon discord in the description along with our social medias, the Patreon, uh, the coffee, the merch, all the stuff, you know, it's all there. Uh, be sure to hit like and subscribe down there to help feed the almighty algorithm. Uh, thank you, Eric, for leaving early. Uh, oh, what? This is what? the lampshade. Oh. I had to take off the lamp so I had lighting for this video. So I just wanted to... <laughs> MacGyvering the hotel room into a studio. Well yeah. done. Uh, <laughs> thank you all so much. New episodes of Kyber Shards every Monday, new Kyber Shards answers every Friday. And until next time, thanks for rolling with us.